Welcome to Siege, a podcast about castles and crusades and other siege engine games, and whatever the hell else we also want to talk about. I am your host, Sam Dillon, and I am here with my wonderful co-host, George. Hello, George. Hi, Sam. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm not too bad. Pretty good, actually. Seeing as uh, how this is our inaugural episode, I'm excited to talk, to talk about CNC. It's one of my favorite games. Top 10. So we wanted to do this podcast because... Because there isn't a lot of other castles and crusades or other siege-related podcasts. That's true. And so we are going to try to fill that gap with our own special brand of CNC discussion. So before we do so, let's introduce ourselves a little bit. George, how long have you been playing CNC? I started playing CNC around 2013, 2014 when uh, the sixth printing of the books came out, the Three Sisters. Oddly enough, I picked up the books prior to that, and it just didn't hit with me at first. But we can talk about that later. Yeah. I picked up the books around 2006, but I didn't really start running and playing the game until about 2009. And I didn't really start regularly playing uh, as my main system for a couple years after that. So, yeah, there's a story there. We'll talk about that eventually. How long have you been playing other games? CNC isn't your first game, right? It's not. I. I started back in maybe 1984 or 85, and uh, I started with AD&D and played through second, third, Pathfinder, and uh, I think with the oncoming of uh, 5e, I switched over to uh, Castles and Crusades, Hyperborea, and a few other, I'll say, OSR-related games. How about you? Yeah, so I've been playing since 1982 or so. Uh, Started with D&D, with AD&D, and then – actually, that's not true. Started with BX, but my brother was DMing, and he quickly moved to AD&D. And then a couple years later, I ended up getting the Frank Mincer Red Box. And so when I started running games, it was with the Beckme version of basic D&D, which – holds a place dear to my heart. Uh, And then I branched out and played all kinds of other games and, you know, the rest is history. I'm sure we will mention a lot of other games when we go through here. So I won't belabor the point now. Um, Let's do one more question and then we'll, we'll get to the episode. What is your favorite thing about castles and crusades? I would say it's the flexibility of the system. Uh, It feels very do-it-yourself to me, that I I can do almost anything with this system, and I can, um, this kind of bleeds into the second part, which is, I enjoy telling the story anymore. Uh, It takes me back to when I first started playing, and uh, I'm really into simplified rules, getting the story out there, and, and most of all, having fun with the system. Nice. Nice. How about you? I think my favorite thing is that it plays quickly and you can use any number of variant rules that you want or or any number of sort of bolted on things that you want to add. There's a, a plethora of variant things that are available. And even a lot of the rules in the player's handbook itself are based on the idea of rulings, not rules. So even a lot of the rules in the player's handbook are kind of optional. (laughs) And I like the fact that it is flexible enough that anybody can who wants to run the game can use any number of those interspersed into their game. And it's still CNC and it still works. It doesn't break the game. Yeah, definitely. So we wanted to start this first episode, and we wanted to spend the time in this first episode talking about 
uh, just the very basics of the system. It's kind of an introductory episode, and so we want to kind of give an introduction to the the system and a very relatively brief one, okay? And talk about what things that are in it that are important and uh, – You know, and then that's going to lead us to maybe bringing up some topics that are going to become full fledged topics for other episodes on their own. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Let's dive in. Awesome. So, the first thing that you need to know about Castles and Crusades is that it is a very DD like game. That is, it it follows the the sort of typical six attributes. So you have strength, dexterity, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, and charisma. And those attributes are generated using 3D6 dice. So you get a number between 3 and 18. And those attributes uh, have modifiers attached to them based on what your value is. And the difference in C&C is that you have a certain – a couple of those – attributes which are considered prime and the other ones are considered non-prime or sometimes referred to as secondary. Which ones that you have prime depends on your class and sometimes your race. So for example, humans, the main benefit they have is that they get to choose three primes. So they'll have one prime based on their class and then they get to pick the other two. Other races only get two primes, one based on their class, and they get to choose the other one. So the Siege system really makes the game easy to play, and that's by doing attribute checks. And with an attribute check, you simply roll d20, you add your modifier for your ability score, and you add your level and, if applicable, any racial bonuses. And you have to compare that to the check for the the game. So you want to beat the challenge class. So George, what happens if I am a rogue and I want to look for traps? So you would have to make a check. And that would be simply having the DM setting a challenge level for the trap that you need to disarm or find at the time. With making that check, you're going to roll your d20 plus your modifier plus your level versus and if applicable your racial bonus and you need to exceed that score now the challenge base works off of if you're prime or secondary that challenge base if you're prime is a 12 and if you're not prime or secondary it's a challenge base of 18 so if the dm determines that that trap is a challenge level four, you're going to take your challenge base plus the four for a six, uh, for if you're prime, it would be a 16 or a 22, 18 plus four, if you're not prime or secondary. And making that check is going to determine your success. And this is why it's important for an individual PC to to select their primes wisely because, for example, a rogue to for a rogue to find a trap that is actually an intelligence check. So they would take their intelligence modifier, they'd roll a d20, they would add that, and the thing is that if they a, a rogue is a dexterity prime, so a rogue must have dexterity as one of their prime attributes if they choose to say have strength as their second primary attribute then and if they're not human then those are the only two they get and then they're not intelligence prime and if they're not intelligence prime that means that even a rogue has a challenge base of 18 to try to find that trap that's a pretty hard role to make that is a pretty hard role to make but what happens is this is one of the more interesting ways of how the the game's classes have what would typically be called niche protection. And that is that as a, a person levels, as a PC levels, they will get better and better at the things that they're already good at because they're always adding their level when they make that check. 
On the other hand, so that so that rogue, let's say that rogue is fifth level. So they're rolling a d20 plus, let's say they have an intelligence modifier of plus one, and they add their level, so that's plus five. So that's a d20 plus six, and they have to beat a 22. So they still have to roll a 16 on the die. But if they're level 10, now they're only having to roll an 11 on the die. Meanwhile, a fighter can also actually technically look for traps. However, the fighter will never ever add their level to their attempt to check for traps because checking for traps or finding traps is a class ability from a different class, and a fighter doesn't have that class ability in their bucket of skills and and whatnot, or in their bucket of abilities. So a fighter who's level 10, even if their intelligence prime now has a harder time finding traps still than a rogue does, even though the rogue started with a challenge base that was much higher. It's a very odd balance you know, that it, it works so well. Yeah, it, it does work well. The problem comes in, and and one of the things that we'll probably discuss in a future episode, when a class does have a lot of abilities that have different primary attributes attached to them. So the rogue is one good example of that. A rogue has some abilities that use dexterity as, its, as the prime attribute or the related attribute. And because they are by necessity, by by – by the rules, because they chose rogue as their class, they are dexterity prime. So that's fine. However, the rogue also has some abilities that are wisdom based and some class abilities that are intelligence based. So if that rogue is not a human, they are definitely going to have some abilities that are technically class abilities that they're not as good at as some of their other class abilities. But they are definitely going to get better at those as they level up, and other individuals, other PCs will not get better at them. So it's this very interesting thing. So that's an interesting conundrum for a player to be in, right? So these are some of the things we're going to talk about later. But let's let's keep talking about this system. So the basics of it are when you're doing a task, there is a challenge class to beat, and that challenge class – as George said, is based on the base that you have, and the base depends on whether you're prime or not, so 12 or 18, and the challenge level of that object. So if the trap is a, is a level 4 trap or a challenge level 4 trap, then that would be the challenge level. If if you are um, trying to save versus a spell that a spellcaster is slinging at you, then the spell level is going to be the challenge level for that save. So if it's a fifth level mag- magic user that's throwing a spell at you or a fifth level wizard that's throwing a spell at you, the challenge level for saving against that spell is a five. If it's a three hit die creature uh, gazing at you to try to paralyze you, the save for that is at a challenge level three. And so there you go. So that those are the sorts of things that affect the challenge base, right? That is, w- what is it that can change how you what what is the can change how difficult the task is okay and, and samuel you you bring up a great point with the spells um because it it seems as though that first level spell that requires a saving throw is based on the hit die or the level of the creature or mm-hmm. character using it right it is so unlike other games where maybe a first level spell is kind of useless at 10th level, Mm -hmm. it's still applicable in this system. Right. Yeah. So if, for example, uh, if there is an enemy spell caster, okay, that is uh, casting a spell at you. um, Maybe Soundburst. (laughs) I knew you were going to bring up Soundburst. So with the Soundburst spell, what happens is the cacophonous sound that that bursts out from the caster has the ability to stun the target. But the target gets a save against that stun effect, and it's a wisdom saving throw. 
So if the level one cleric casts that spell at you and you're trying to save, the challenge level, that is the CL part of the number you need to beat, is just a one because it's a level one cleric. Okay. And that means that what you're rolling against is you're rolling a D20. You're going to add your wisdom modifier. You're going to add your level. Let's assume you're level one as well. And you're going to add uh, any kind of a bonus that you might get against spellcasting, okay, based on race or something. And your challenge class, the number you're trying to beat, is your challenge base plus your challenge level. Now, the challenge base is either 12 or 18. Let's say you're not Wisdom Prime. So in that case, if you're not Wisdom Prime, your challenge base is 18. And the CL in this case is a one. So you need to roll a 19 to save against this stunning effect of the soundburst spell. On the other hand, if you are Wisdom Prime, your CB, your challenge base, is only 12 plus one because the CL is one. So that's a 13. So you only need to get a 13 or higher. That's a lot easier to get than, a, than an 18, right? On the other hand, if the cleric that is casting the soundburst at you is a level five cleric, the CL is no longer one. The CL is five because the caster level is five. Okay. Because in a lot of other games that shall remain nameless, it's the spell level that is the thing that you're saving against. But in this case, you're saving against that caster's ability, and their ability is based on their level, not the spell's level. So this keeps spells relevant and dangerous, even at higher levels. And as well, when, when you're a higher level character, right, and you're fighting, mm -hmm. let's say, some low-level clerics or cultists, and they go to throw a spell against you. That first level cleric throwing a sound burst against the tenth level paladin is going to have a very unlikely chance of getting that spell to stick. Right. That's right. Not because of the spell, but because of the the cultist casting it as a very low level. Yep. Exactly. So with proper planning, that can work for you or against you. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I don't think we need to discuss either the 40th level hit die dragon that's breathing <laughs> flames upon you. Yeah, we don't need to discuss that. Very difficult. So so one of the major differences between Castles and Crusades and a lot of other D&D-like games is that saves are very difficult to make for non-prime abilities. So even if you're a human and you have three primes, when you roll a saving throw, you're rolling the same thing as with an attribute check. You're rolling a d20 plus that attribute modifier plus your level. And if you have any uh, you know, magic items that protect you from certain things, then you might add a bonus for those. But your, your, your challenge class, how it's created or how it's determined, is based, again, on the hit die of the creature that's casting or the level of the, of the wizard that's casting or, or cleric. So if you're non prime for that particular saving throw, it's going to be really difficult for you to make that save even at higher levels, especially against more powerful creatures. And, and Samuel, I, I like the idea of when we were talking about our fifth level thief rogue, I should say, uh, when they go to make a, let's say, a hide attempt. They're prime in decks, and they decide to sneak past a guard. They have a place to hide and everything like that. It's going to work that they have to make a siege check, and they're going to use the hit die of the guard, right? Correct. To sneak past them. That's right. Right. So there are no opposed roles in Castles and Crusades. So it's not a matter of the rogue rolling to see how well they hide and then the guard rolling to see how well he can see the rogue. Instead, it's the rogue, the active character, rolling to see how well they hide against a challenge class that is based on the skill set or abilities of the guard or the, the opponent. So if that guard is a level three town guard, okay, or a three hit die town guard, then when the rogue rolls that hide check, 
they're going to roll a d20. They're going to add their dexterity modifier. They're going to add their level. So their fifth level, let's say their dex modifier is a plus two. So they're adding a seven. And because they're a rogue, uh, maybe they're a halfling. So they get a plus two bonus to hide because halflings get that, right? So now it's a plus nine. So they're rolling a d20 plus nine. And the number they're trying to beat is their challenge base, which is 12, plus the perceptive abilities of the guard, which is based on that guard's hit dice, which I said was a 3. So they have to roll a 15, but they're rolling a d20 plus 9. So they have a pretty good chance of success. That's a 6 or better. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Now, if that guard was a level 15 palace king's elite guard... (laughs) Not as good a chance. <laughs> so, and I think one of the nice things about CNC is that you can also change the challenge level a little bit. So, what if, what if this uh, guard is also a uh, maybe is a, a guard, but it's a cleric of uh, Heimdall, mm-hmm. the the Gate Watcher, things like that, right? Right. Yep. Can they- yep. Would you, as a CK castle keeper, would you increase that CL maybe, or if yeah, it's hallowed I, ground, or I would, sure, absolutely. Usually by just a one or a two, um, but if it was meant to be, uh, if it was a scene I had already conceived of previously, and it was meant to be very difficult, maybe even a four. Mm. Yeah, and see, I think that's one of the aspects of CNC that I really enjoy is. And this is for or against the players. You can change that CL. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. Let, let's say let's say that guard was moonlighting as a bouncer at the tavern, and things got heated the night before, and they were up all night trying to keep the peace, and so they didn't get a lot of sleep. So now that guard is tired standing there. They're not going to be very perceptive. So now I might actually reduce the challenge level. Right, right. Uh, you can give a negative to the encounter, uh, to the challenge level. Absolutely. If a if a if a rogue is uh, walking down uh, a hallway in a dungeon and they're using a ten foot pole and they tell me, you know, that they're walking slowly and tapping and they're they're listening for uh, for for hollow sounds and they're listen uh, they're they're paying attention to the height so they're looking for any sort of uh, raised up tiles and whatnot and they tell me a really good description of what they're looking for. I might even reduce the challenge level of that pit trap from a from a four to a one. Interest. Yeah, that that's and I think that's what's great about the system is that you're if you're doing it well, you're giving bonuses to the players for good play. Right. And I, I don't feel a lot of other systems do that or, or embrace that, I should say. Yeah. Well, and the and the other thing that CNC does really well too is it, it does really embrace the idea of only make the the player roll if there are interesting consequences, right? Yes, absolutely. It's very non-modern in that way. In 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 modern D and D like games, it seems like because of all the skill systems and and abilities that are attached to the classes and races and and all the different things that are put in there. Look, people love to roll dice. There's no shame in that. I love rolling dice. I have a huge dice collection. But the problem is the more you roll, the more chances you have of failure. And in Castles and Crusades, there really aren't that many areas where you get a bonus. So the more you roll, you're really increasing the likelihood that you're going to fail something. Okay. And so really what what the book actually suggests is you don't make them roll unless there are important or interesting consequences to failure. Right. If if the if every or if it's if it's obvious, you don't need to make them roll. So, for example, if they're walking down a well lit hall and they're not distracted in any way, they're not tired in any way, and there's a huge pit trap that's just open right in the middle of the room, they're gonna see that it's not hidden. So you don't need to make them roll. Exactly. 
On the other hand, if it's dark, if there aren't any torches, if the if the the character with twilight vision is sneaking ahead in the forest and there's a thick canopy and there's a lot of fog and they can't hardly see, even if they're a ranger and so they get sort of a bonus to find wilderness traps, it's really dark. They're still going to have to roll because they might see it, but they might see it too late and accidentally trigger the trap or they might not see it at all. And it's worth the roll because there might be consequences to missing the the detection of that trap. Whereas if it's broad daylight, there is a bright sun shining out and it's really obvious because there is one single pile of leaves in the middle of a clearing. OK, they're going to investigate that. They don't need to roll. They can easily move the leaves away and see that there's a covered pit trap. I, I completely agree. And one of the moments I had in a game regarding not rolling is um, the ranger decided to run down a hill, a very steep hill. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was like, you easily make it down. Uh, One thing, he was an elven ranger. Okay. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. you're in your element. You got this. You've done it this thousands of times before. Next to him was the human paladin in full plate armor who decides to go down the hill after the ranger. (laughs) And I was like, you need to roll. And uh, the the player was thrown off a little bit. He's like, why do I need to roll? I'm like, you're not an elven ranger. You know, (laughs) (laughs) you're in full plate. You're going down a hill. You got a lot going for you. You got a big backpack on you. So, and uh, I didn't penalize them heavily, but. It was enough to try to make a point that you're not as good. You know? Right. Yep. It, it adds a flavor to the game. Yeah. Yeah. And and CNC is a game that is very much in the the ethos of the answer's not on the character sheet. For the most part, the answer's not on the character sheet. Yeah, you might need to look at your attributes once in a while to see what your bonus is, right? When you're about to make a roll. But for the most part, there's no heavy skill system. There's no giant parcel of extra benefits and bonuses and additional widgets that you get just for making a couple of choices during character creation. There are some things, right? The ranger is different from the rogue, is different from the fighter, is different from the wizard, is different from the barbarian, right? There are some da- some 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 important differences. But for the most part, the focus of the game is on creative resolution of interesting situations and the more creative a player can be and the more interesting they can make the game and the more fun that the game can be you're not going to find that on your character sheet exactly and i think it also goes that with selecting your primes while there's definite benefits to you know different checks and things there's other advantages so for example um it it doesn't mean that the barbarian has the barbarian class has to be prime and constitution but there's nothing to say that the barbarian can't be prime and charisma mm-hmm. and or intelligence yeah and and this i think plays up that character class um it makes it a lot more interesting, you know, the, and your story for your character could be, he's just very charismatic. Maybe he was the son of, you know, or of the king, or, you know, he's a prince or just, you know, mm-hmm. well-liked for the charisma aspect or just very intelligent. Right. You know, now you have a slightly different barbarian. You're not focusing on the I'm prime and uh, con strength and dex. You know, uh, you're now a little bit more unexpected for the DM. Right. Right. And you can role play these things. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the key there. And I think that's something that kind of gets missed in the choosing of primes, because I think what happens is players say, "Okay, wait, I'm a human, so I get three primes. I have to be prime whatever. I have to be prime con because I'm a barbarian. Oh, let's see. Based on the skills that are the abilities that this that this class gets, what are the best primes for me? And my thing is, I don't care what the best primes are. I think you should play a character that would be interesting for you. So if you think that it would be really fun to have a charismatic barbarian, 
and you choose charisma as your second prime, awesome. It doesn't matter that none of your abilities are attached to that. It doesn't matter. And if you're a rogue and you choose to have uh, you know, constitution as uh, your prime, great. You're a big, hardy rogue rather than a little skinny, sickly, sneaky one, right? Like, no big deal. But if you role play that, it's really fun. And it also means you're probably going to fail some roles that you otherwise would have passed. But the thing about C&C is you don't have to optimize everything. So an interesting aspect to this is the save types. And these are listed on 211 of the eighth printing of the player's handbook. You know, um, and I look at it a lot of times is how do I not want to die? Okay. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, uh, so for example, being prime in constitution helps you against disease, energy, energy drain, and poison. Being prime in charisma helps you against death attack, charm, and fear. So even from a role-playing aspect, that barbarian who is uh chose his second prime as charisma. He's going to most likely make his saves versus fear, charm, and death attacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would not want my barbarian to go running from battle because someone threw a fear spell on me. Right. How yep. horrible would that be? Exactly. That would be a, a very uh, well-known barbarian at that point <laughs> he would get a reputation really fast <laughs> yeah. And, yeah and i think i think it also you know it keeps your character fun from a role-playing aspect you're somewhat protected from certain saving throws you know and uh it, it just makes it more interesting yep All right. Well, I think we've veered into uh, philosophy <laughs> rather than actual game mechanics. That's OK. I have no problem with that whatsoever, because I think a lot of the game. Right. So and this is this is actually something that's a benefit in CNC as well. And that is that uh, the game that happens around the table, it can be different at every table because castle keepers, that's the CNC term for, you know, a GM. Castle keepers are different and all the players are different. And, you know, the thing about role playing games just in general is that the magic happens, right? The magic happens yeah. based on the people that are sitting at that table. And because it's uh, heavily leans towards a rulings, not rules kind of perspective, that means that various different GMs can run the game in various different ways. And you have this very interesting emergent gameplay that comes out of it. That is definitely Castles and Crusades, but is also a slightly different Castles and Crusades than somebody else's table. And part of that is exactly what George is talking about. It's playing that barbarian with a constitution prime and a charisma prime or playing the rogue as a, a you know high charisma rogue who is very fast and dexterous or playing uh, the um, – Playing the wizard as uh, high intelligence, but also high strength. Boy, he loves you know hitting things with his staff. Like those things make it interesting and different. And the game is open and flexible enough to be able to deal with any choice that that player wants to make, and the game still works. Is there anything else you'd like to say on this episode? I think we covered the basics of the siege system really well. Yeah. I think so, too. So in the future, you can expect different discussions based on uh, different items, different parts of the game. So, of course, we're going to talk about, you know, combat encounters, but also we're going to have, you know, discussions about social encounters. Of course, we're going to talk about rules in the player's handbook, which are the core rules. But, of course, we're also going to talk about things in the Castle Keeper's Guide. We're going to talk about other games as well and how you might bring rules from there into Castles and Crusades or into the other Siege System games. We're going to talk about different adventures. We're going to talk about converting things. We're going to talk about using products from other companies. We have a whole lot to talk about. It's a very rich game. It's a very uh, rich 
ecosystem right now in gaming, and so there is a ton to talk about. If you would like to have us address a particular topic, you can uh, contact us on Discord. We're on the Troller Games Discord, and uh, you can ping DM Samuel, that's me, or you can ping Ultra Magnus, that's George. Uh, you can also send an email to dndebrief at gmail.com. That's dndebrief at gmail.com, and just title it, you know, Siegecast and We'd love to have a conversation with you, and we'll try to listen to listener requests and talk about things that are interesting to other people, because that's kind of the point of the podcast. Anything before you sign out, George? Oh, I just hope everyone enjoys the game. Yeah, me too. But I have one last thing to say, and that is my very awesome wife has designed a board game, and that board game is called Six of Eight. It's about Henry VIII and his wives. And it's on pre-order, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Don't kill me. (laughs) 